On Tuesday the 7th of February 1967, 110 separate fires ravaged southern Tasmania. From Hamilton and Bothwell in the north to the tip of the Channel Country in the south. Agricultural lands in the Derwent Valley and Huon Valley were severely damaged. Fire swept the north and west suburbs of Hobart and the slopes of Mount Wellington. Whole seaside towns along the Derwent estuary and east of Hobart were wiped out. In just five hours, over half a million acres of southern Tasmania would be destroyed and 62 people would lose their lives. The penetration of these fires into the urban areas of Hobart was sudden and devastating. The electric power supply was severed, kilometres of telephone lines were destroyed and the airport was closed by smoke. Communication to northern Tasmania and mainland Australia was cut, leaving Hobart isolated from the outside world. It would be weeks before the full scale of death and destruction was known. These fires caused the largest loss of life and property on any single day in the history of the Australian continent. John Gledhill is currently the Chief Fire Officer at the Tasmania Fire Service. But on the morning of the 7th of February 1967, he was a 14-year-old schoolboy living with his family in Lindisfarne and helping his veterinarian father in his spare time. It was the first day back after the Christmas holidays. I remember it had been a really hot summer. Um, but that first day back was strange. Uh, very early in the day, it became really smoky and the view which you can normally see right across Hobart had just disappeared. Um, the smoke everywhere. I remember the kids talking in the playground about what was going on and trying to find out, but no one knew. Even the teachers didn't know what was happening. There was obviously bushfires out there, uh, and serious ones. Of the 110 fires burning on that Tuesday, 90 had started prior to the 7th of February, and 70 of these were free burning on the morning of the 7th. Across the harbour from Lindisfarne, at 400 Strickland Avenue, lives six-year-old Karen Schofield. Karen and her aunt Linny have just returned home from school. Their first day back at school was, they always finished at lunchtime. And I knew when Minnie rang there was a problem. A wall of fire is roaring down through Ferntree and has destroyed the Ferntree Hotel. Embers spotting ahead of this front are setting houses alight in Strickland Avenue. She'd gone down home to ring, they didn't have a phone on up here, to say that there was bushfires around and we'd better try and get up or do something. Then she said, I can't stop, I've got to go, it's coming up through the gully. Phil Cheney, a forestry officer working for the Forestry and Timber Bureau in Canberra, was part of the team who flew in to investigate the fires. The gully behind me is Browns River, and you can see the dead trees which were killed by the 1967 fires. 
and now the regrowth forest which has grown up underneath them. And there was a fire in Browns River which had been burning for most of the day and the Hobart fire burnt across the Huon Highway, burnt across Waterworks Road and Strickland Avenue and then another fire from the Sleeping Beauty came over the top of Mount Wellington and around the sides and pulled the other two fires in together into a culmination here at Fern Tree. At Colebrook, a prosperous sheep and cattle town 34 kilometres from Hobart, Michael Munnings, a 10-year-old farm boy, has just been taken from his school by his mother. In the next half hour, Michael's town will burn to the ground. When Mum picked me up from the um, state school and was walking up the road, it was probably half a block. It was extremely windy and the smoke and uh, we walked from the state school up to and inside the railway hotel. In the seaside town of Margate, Sid Lovell, 23, is processing salmon when the factory starts to burn. We looked back at the factory and it was all ablaze. There was a few explosions uh, and everything, but you looked over the back and the uh, trees and everything and it was just exploding. The fire would just be jumping across with the wind blowing. The only thing that had actually stopped the fire, I'll go any further, is this, this water here. Back at Colebrook, things have gone from bad to worse for Michael and other evacuees sheltering at the railway hotel as their town burns around them. We sheltered in there. I don't know how long it was for, but we was looking out the window and we see the Colebrook store catch on fire. And we were concerned because there was fuel at the shop that, you know, the place could blow up and we'd be blown away with it. Mothers and fathers all over Hobart are racing back to their homes. Many can't contact their children. They don't know if they're safe. Traffic, smoke and fire are blocking their path. I rang Neville and I said, look, there's fires up round home. We'd better try and do something. So he came to around the corner and he picked me up and that's when we attempted to get up here. Yeah, we left the city and decided to head home to Strickland Avenue to uh, pick our daughter up. So we drove up Davy Street to Ewan Road where there was a barricade and was stopped and told we weren't allowed to go through. So we then decided to, to attempt to go through Strickland Avenue from the Cascade Road and they, that was barricaded also and we weren't allowed through. So we then drove back to this spot and decided we'd go through the barricade irrespective, so we drove straight through it. Neville and Joy make it to the top of Strickland Avenue, but their path is blocked by a fallen tree. Their only option is to reverse back up the road. When I opened the door to try and see the reverse, flames shot through one side of the car and out the other, because my wife had the other door open as well, trying to guide me. All the time, the wind's whirling and then it just opens up and it's like a orange light would come on. We backed up and we end up over here somewhere and there was some blokes working, not working, they were trying to put out the fires and we asked them about who got out the avenue and they said no one. And he just said, wind your window up lady and get out of here. So we had no choice but to leave and turn around and go back down through the fire. We still hadn't heard. But we had carrot. Back at Margate, things are desperate as workers and residents climb onto boats to escape the flames. People were coming down the road and coming down onto the wharf. Uh, there was a lot of fishing boats uh, at the wharf at the time and uh, the owners were getting the people to get onto the boats so they could take them out into the middle of the harbour just to make them safe. Uh, they didn't know that because there was gas in that uh, in the factory that could have been exploded. We couldn't do anything with the factory so we just stayed out in the water and uh, looked on. Yeah, it's churning me up in the, in the stomach by looking back in there and that and just thinking of what went on that day feeling all churned up. Mm.
As the Colebrook store bursts into flames, Michael and his family flee the railway hotel. They head out of town to the safety of Hardwick House. After we left the railway hotel, we drove along this road in the back of Mr Isles' truck. We uh, come to here and then our house was up there and there was a big pine tree there, a big yellow pine tree. We see that engulfed in flames and the, with the wind and the smoke was taking it all that way and we knew then that the house wouldn't be there when we come back. Yeah, when we came in from the water, we knew it was safe to come back. Um, there was a small flat tray uh, truck uh, there, so I decided that I'd go for a drive to see if I could help anyone down at Snug. I drove down there and it was just an absolute shambles. People were crying and screaming and... If you could see what a V-52 can do to a village, you'd understand what Snug looked like, a wreck. The period of really dangerous fire behaviour was really quite short. Although these fires had been burning for some time, they really didn't start to move until after 10.30. And then the staggering thing about the fire behaviour was that they'd just about all merged together by 3 o'clock. And in places like down on the channel, uh, it had come together incredibly quickly, so people had no idea of which fire was burning them or where it was coming from. Back at Lindisfarne, John Gledhill has no recollection of how he got home from school. I can't remember coming home that day but I must have come home here on the school bus late in the afternoon. It was still really smoky. And one of the things I, re I remember of that afternoon, probably later in the afternoon, was looking out to the Queen's Domain and seeing flames burning. And they were the first flames I'd seen through the day. And I think that really started to bring it home to me that uh, something was really, really, really wrong. Joy and Neville still have no news on Karen. Oh, we were, she was panicked. We just very worried and uh, just didn't know what to do. I can't describe my feelings. When we got down, it was a loss, a terrible loss. But I thought. I thought I'd lost a daughter. Fortunately, later that evening, we were told that they were safe. And the relief was just, just amazing. Karen's 15-year-old auntie caught the bus home with her that morning. They were the last ones to get through to Strickland Avenue. The police bashed on the door and then sort of strode in and said we had to get out of the house. Um, no time to grab anything, just go. So we, we sort of got in the car and loads of people, loads of dogs, cats, fur cage, and we only got as far as, as the top of Stricken Avenue, Hill and Road turn off, and the firemen said no, they want to take us up to the mountain, the firemen said don't be stupid, you can't take them up there, the whole place is on fire. We sort of end up piling into the, this gutter ditch type of thing at uh, the bottom of Finger Post track. 
This is the first time Joy has seen the gutter that Karen and ten other people sheltered in as the fire raged around them. Colebrook was one of the worst hit rural towns. Only a few buildings remained and livestock losses were in the tens of thousands. It didn't really hit me until the following day what had really happened when we went back to where the house was and Dad and Mum were fostering around the ruins and I went down to where I was last playing with some of my toys and that's when I first started to get upset. So I broke down and cried then. But And I had a <coughs> little white dog and he was burnt and still on the chain. The only smell I can remember from the fires was the smell of burnt flesh, burnt animal flesh, because my dad was a vet at the time and I can remember going to his surgery a few days after the fires and uh, there was burnt animals, every cage had burnt animals in, but it was the sickly sweet smell of flesh that I, I can still smell. After the fires in the holiday town of Snug, only 40 houses were still standing. Before the fires, there were 125. Five hours earlier, there was houses at the law. When I went back down there next time, there was one or two, three or four. And you wouldn't think the way the fire went through there, that it could take two or three houses there, leave one, jump over and take another one or two and go on and then probably wipe out a, another four or five. This scene was repeated throughout southern Tasmania. As news of the disaster filtered through to northern Tasmania and the mainland, messages of support and money flooded in. The relief effort was astounding in its generosity. There were non-stop offers of food and clothing for the thousands left only with the clothes they stood up in. The damage to the state's economy was staggering. The amount estimated conservatively in 1967 at $40 million. As the Hobart community slowly recovered and rebuilt, many asked how such a horrific disaster could have happened. In those days, bushfires were, were common and uh, they were allowed to, to burn. No one worried about them too much and I think that was one of the main reasons for the disaster. Only 22 of the 110 fires identified were started accidentally. 88 of the fires occurring in the Hobart region were deliberately lit. Fire was part of the rural life in Tasmania, and particularly in summer. Uh, people burnt off uh, getting new pick for grazing or for clearing. Or, and in many cases, we found that we traced the fire origin back to a stack of timber that had been lit up maybe a month earlier and had broken away under the extreme conditions. These days, fires aren't left unattended or left in remote areas or, in fact, anywhere to burn unchecked. All fires through the dangerous months of the summer are checked and dealt with uh, as soon as possible. The Hobart bushfires came within two kilometres of central Hobart, killing 20 people and destroying 432 houses. Like Canberra in 2003, no one believed in 1967 that bushfires could penetrate the urban areas and come into the city. Bushfires happened in the bush. The interface, the, the length of contact of houses with the bush has probably doubled since 67. Where it was scattered, now it's almost continuous. So there's many more houses in the interface and close to the forest. But what's really different about now and 67 is the condition of the gardens. The blocks were small in 67 and most of the gardens were of an English style. Now the blocks are bigger and the gardens have gone to a native style garden with leaf litter and mulch, which is enormously uh, flammable. And it brings into the picture the sort of conditions that we had in Canberra in 2003. While the fire intensities were similar, the penetration into Canberra was probably three times what it was 
in Hobart. And this was all taken by the condition of the gardens. The fire was carried by the gardens, not by the forest. The forest just threw the sparks in and then it continued to burn on the garden fuels and the houses. And today we would get a similar thing in Tasmania. I think the really big lesson from the Tasmanian fires was that there was only one fire that actually burnt into the, the western outskirts of Hobart City through Waterworks Road and through to Taruna. That fire started at Lime Kiln Gully. And the important, really important thing is that under those extreme weather conditions, that same damage would have occurred if none of the other fires had occurred or existed. And we know that in the future, that we don't need 110 fires to cause conflagration damage in an urban area. We can get it from a single fire if the fuel is in the urban area, in the houses and the gardens that burn. As a result of the fires, a new fire organisation was set up, an integrated fire service of both rural and urban, career and volunteer firefighters, all working together. We have state-of-the-art equipment and we have state-of-the-art communications. Building fires, bushfires, it doesn't matter, it's, it's dealt with by the single organisation completely different to 38 years ago. A fire permit system was also introduced to control when, how and where fires are lit. Controls have been placed on urban development and subdivision planning. There is bushfire education, awareness and training for the community to assist them in managing their properties in the event of a fire. We know that the weather conditions that cause extreme fire behaviour are going to occur again. We know that under these conditions we are going to get accidental fires that will burn very, very fast and severely. And no matter how good our fire service is, we just can't stop fires under these conditions. So the people on the interface have to be vigilant they have to appreciate that fires will penetrate into the suburban area and they need to take heed and maintain the setbacks from the forest vegetation and they have to maintain the fuels in their own gardens and they have to be prepared to defend themselves if the fire service can't be there. The future isn't just a great fire service and more fire trucks. When we get those severe weather days and fires on those severe weather days. We're going to need the cooperation of the people at risk if we're going to limit the damage significantly. It's a shared responsibility. It doesn't just belong to the fire service, it belongs also to those at risk. Many people left work that day and went straight out firefighting. They weren't trained, they had no protective clothing or equipment. A message from uh, Mrs Jerker at 49 Derwin Park Road. Marie and Nigel have been burnt out at Southport, but all family are safe. Would you please ring 76587? 76 Three out of the four local radio stations were off the air. John Gledhill remembers listening to radio reports throughout the night, confirming people's safety and location. There was a lot of confusion. You only have to look at the papers from the day to realise that information took a long time to come out. It was days as for the story to really unfold. Roads were blocked, uh, power lines and trees uh, across roads meant people couldn't get around. Communications were really difficult and so information was difficult. It was quite apparent that uh, people were traumatised and the whole place was in shock. And I think to a certain extent it is today and certainly there are many, many people in Tasmania that uh, bear the scars and the trauma from that day. Through there. Look at that. Uh, we've spoken between Mum and Dad and I heaps of times and family about what happened that day. Everyone tells their stories and that. But yeah. it wasn't until I was asking Mum, did she want to do this with me? Um, and we did get talking about it again and, and she got upset and it's the first time um, I've ever known Mum in all those years since 
that she actually broke down on the phone. Yeah. We got to just about down here before we turned back, Neville. I realised then what it meant Neville? to maybe, you know, be th threatened with losing a child or how worried they were about me. I mean, I knew the day they saw me, they were pleased to see me again, but yeah, it's the first time I've ever seen one cry in all those years. Hobart and Tasmania is such a small place that everyone knows someone that was directly affected by the fires. It was etched deeply into everyone's memory. And I guess I'm no different. Uh, I still carry memories of that day. Of the 62 people who perished that day, over a third died in the open after fleeing from their homes. The ghost stags of 67, like crosses on a hillside, also stand to remind us that fires could once again sweep across Greater Hobart, causing loss and devastation to the people of Tasmania. I guess I was staggered by the strength of the people under these conditions, who in many cases had lost so much, and yet they still wanted to help us understand what happened. We shouldn't forget Black Tuesday for the death, for the damage and for the trauma that it wrought on the community. If we ignore our history, we stand the risk of being condemned by it. For me, it's the day against which we measure everything.